Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazhin astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd We greet you with the greeting of peace Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Here from our sitting room in uh, and our apartment in uh, Gumbak in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Uh, last Wednesday, I delivered a lecture entitled uh, Beyond the Petrodollar, an Islamic response to the bogus monetary system. And that lecture was delivered at the Surau Al Amin in Sitapak here in Kuala Lumpur. Unfortunately, because of a breakdown in communication, the lecture was not recorded. And uh, as a consequence of that, I'm now repeating the lecture here from my sitting room. The topic, Beyond the Petrodollar, an Islamic response to the bogus monetary system. This is the third of a series of three lectures on the subject of money, Islam and money. Uh, in the first lecture, we explained using the Qur'an and using the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, we explained what is money in Islam. And uh, if anyone differs with us, if they, they hold the view that we are wrong, then they must tell us what is right. That's only fair. Uh, we use the Qur'an to demonstrate that money in Islam is essentially something called dinar and something called dirham. And uh, while some of our critics are not aware of it, the word, the word dinar is located in the Qur'an. And the word dirham is located in the Qur'an. And... Uh, when dinar and dirham are used in the Qur'an, they represent a, a, a coin made of gold, a gold coin and a silver coin. Um, <coughs> and uh, therefore money in Islam is essentially gold and silver coins, dinar and dirham. But then we found that uh, uh, in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Islam, that when dinar and dirham were in short supply in the market, uh, that other things were also used as money. What are those other things? They are always commodities of food consumption, commodities of food consumption, which are in abundant supply in the market and which have a shelf life, not like mangoes which will rot. And in the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ identified wheat and barley and dates and salt. And using analogical reasoning, we added to that rice, not the rice where the, the skin is taken off, rice, uh, the rice, which is called paddy, the skin is still intact. So that rice has a longer shelf life. Mm -hmm. Paddy rice. So rice can also be used as money. Uh, sugar can also be used as money. Sugar can last for some time. And uh, you would then buy and sell using sugar, using rice. Uh, you will therefore, to use the correct term, monetize your rice. Rice will now be used as money. What are the functions of money? Number one, uh, to be a medium of exchange. Number two, to function as a measure of value. And number three, to function as a store of value. And we found that money in Islam was always, always, always money with intrinsic value. What is, what is what is intrinsic value? Intrinsic value is that the money has a value which is located 
inside the money. It's not located outside where it can be manipulated to make Indonesia a slave country and to make Pakistan and Bangladesh and, in, and Egypt and the rest of the Arab world, non-petroleum Arab world, miserably poor by manipulating the value of the money. No, once the money, the value of the money is inside the money, no one can take it away from you unless they come and they take it out of your pocket. So money in Islam always has intrinsic value. And when you use such money, and provided that demand and supply remain constant, the same price you'd pay for a sheep or for a chicken a thousand years ago, the same price you'll pay today. How wonderful, isn't it? How wonderful. No inflation. <laughs> no inflation. This is money in the Quran and this is money in the Sunnah. And that's what we explained about money in the first lecture. Uh, that it was a reliable store of value. If you had your money stored 15, 20, 40, 100 years later, you could take out the money and you could still buy what you could have bought 100 years earlier. If you had enough money to buy 100 cattle and you kept that money for 100 years, 100 years later when you take that money out, you could still buy the 100 cattle, provided, of course, that demand and supply remain constant. That was the first lecture. And if there are those who differ with me and they say that I'm wrong, well then tell me what is right. Tell me what is money in Islam. Okay? And then we went to the second lecture in which uh, Allah warned us. He warned us in the Quran, don't take them as your friends and allies. Don't Take them as your friends and allies. No. And if you do that, you no longer belong to us, you belong to them. Who was Allah talking about? He was talking about an alliance of Jews and Christians. Yeah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. A'uzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. Yeah, ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who have faith in Allah. Don't take them as your friends and allies. Who? An alliance of Jews and Christians. When a Jewish-Christian alliance emerges, do not turn to them with friendship and alliance. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you belong to them. In Allah they are a wicked people. And Allah does not provide guidance for a wicked people. This is how we began the lecture. That Jewish Christian alliance has now be, uh, emerged in history. It is the Zionist Jews and Zionist Christians who have who have reconciled and made friendship and alliance. And they are the ones who control power in the United States of America. They control, and they boast of it, we control the United States. They control Britain, the power in Britain, they control power in France. They control power in the Western world, what is called Western civilization. They are the ones who have NATO as a military arm. And they are the ones who have a messianic, a mysterious messianic agenda. They want to rule the world. They want to establish the political dominion, the economic dominion, the monetary dominion over all of mankind. That's what they want to do. That's arrogance. But not all Christians are like that. And not all Jews are like that. No. <laughs> These these are the Christians and the Jews of modern Western civilization. Russia is not a part of Western civilization, no. And Allah warns us in the Quran, don't take them as your friends and allies. Don't enter into their embrace. And that is precisely what happened. This is the people, this is the civilization which were empowered by a scientific and technological revolution. 
and uh, applied that scientific and technological revolution to military science and they gained a military power unique in all of human history and they used that military power to oppress at the point of a naked bloody sword they went to conquer the world what is Britain doing in Britain? A little island called Britain. What is Britain doing controlling the whole of India? Tell me. Huh? And Britain is in China and Britain is here and Britain. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Why? Why this mysterious colonization of the world? Answer, they want to rule the whole world. And one of the strategies which they employ to establish their dominion over mankind is to change the money. To remove the money that Allah has ordained, dinar and dirham, to prohibit the use of gold as money, which is shirk. Are you hearing me? Did you hear what I say? It is shirk. It is blasphemy. Every Christian knows the meaning of blasphemy. Every Jew knows the meaning of blasphemy. When a Muslim uses the term blasphemy, it is shirk to prohibit what Allah has permitted. And Allah has permitted gold as money, and they prohibit the use of gold as money. That's what they did in the International Monetary Fund, the Articles of Agreement, prohibit the use of gold as money. So you can't use a dinar as money anymore. And by implication, since you can't use dinar, you can't use dirham. This is blasphemy. And whosoever follows them in that shirk also become party to the shirk. This is the monetary system which they created. And we, the second lecture explained that monetary system based on shirk. Based on shirk. And they use that monetary system with, with indescribable hatred and animosity and hostility for Muslims. That's what they are. And use that monetary system to exploit, to rip off and to oppress and finally to enslave people. And so today we find a world of Islam and also the rest of mankind who are not supporting them, miserably poor, miserably poor, enslaved. And uh, it's because you take paper and you give to that paper uh, a fictitious value, no intrinsic value. And that fictitious value is such that when they print the paper, it's called hard currency. And once their paper is in demand, they can give a high value to it and they can print as much as they want. And so they could buy the whole world free of charge. You could buy the whole world free of charge. Once the donkeys are demanding the paper. And then when we Muslims also want to join in the fun of blasphemy, and we also abandon, surrender the dinar and dirham, and we also start to print paper. But our paper is not hard currency, no. So our paper can't be used. You take a whole basket full of Pakistani rupees to Midtown Manhattan, and you want to buy a cup of coffee. Huh? You think you could buy a cup of coffee with a basket full of Pakistani rupees in Midtown Manhattan? No, you can't. No, you can't. But you could take one Indonesia, you could take one US dollar and buy whatever you want in any village in Indonesia. Anywhere in the world you go with a US dollar, you can use it. But the Pakistani rupee can only be used here in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So they have an advantage. We pointed out that this was an unjust system. We pointed out that this was bogus and fraudulent. And we, we, gave, a, we gave an explanation of how the Bretton Woods Accord emerged. We explained to you how the US dollar became His Majesty, the US dollar. It replaced the British pound. We showed you how this marked the end of Pax Britannica and the beginning of Pax Americana. And it, 
gave to the United States a status, which is now the ruling state in the world. We did all of this in the second lecture. Then we pointed out how uh, Charles de Gaulle, General Charles de Gaulle, not a Muslim leader, no, a French leader, he recognized this to be unjust. And he stood up in the French National Assembly and he denounced this unjust monetary system in 1966. And the Zionists came after him and they, they, they removed him, removed him. Yes. But then the successes to Charles de Gaulle continued to attack the system until finally in 1971, the United States had to give up and they abandoned the US dollar being redeemable in gold. And so the entire monetary system has absolutely no links with gold anymore. It is 100% haram. And then we showed how from 1971 to 1973, the US dollar was in no man's land. Uh, I know you're listening to me, listening to me, I'm talking about this again and again and again and again. So please bear with me. Why? Because there are others who can't hear and others who don't want to hear. So we have to repeat again and again and again and again. If you're fed up of listening to me, go listen to somebody else. But I have to keep on repeating for those who, do, who cannot hear and for those who don't want to hear. They're afraid to hear. Then Charles de Gaulle, his successors caused them to, the, the system collapsed in 1971. In 1971 to 1973, the US dollar was in no man's land. And then in 1974, because of the Arab-Israeli war, they hit the jackpot with the birth of the petrodollar. I explained this in the last lecture, that the US dollar is now His Majesty the petrodollar. And that this petrodollar was prophesied by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam in a hadith that we'll quote shortly. When the Arabs decided, agreed with Henry Kissinger to his demand that we sell oil for only USD, which is haram. But they didn't understand what is haram. Then the petrodollar was born and there was no limit now to the amount of petrodollars you could print. You could print as much as you want. There's no charge they call to stop you anymore. No one can raise a finger because the system has no links whatsoever with gold. The link is now with oil, thanks to the Arabs. The petrodollar is born. And then we showed how they use this system, monetary system, to consolidate their power. To be able to use this newfound wealth, which is of course fictitious wealth, uh, to, to, to empower the banking system now, to eventually take over. They want the money to expand and expand and expand and expand. And if it's not expanding at a fast enough rate, then they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they use a new system. I just can't remember what it is now. It's called um, to just put seven, seven trillion dollars to the bank. Um, I can't remember the word now. And uh, the seven trillion, when it goes with a check from the, the, the office of the President of the United States to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve then issues a check to the banking system for seven trillion dollars. That's not money as yet. No, it's just a check. But when the banking system now lends that money to Pakistan, or to a fellow called Mursi in Egypt, who said he was Muslim and he said his, oh, his organization, Ikhwan al Muslim, was a great Islamic movement, but you're still ready to borrow money from the IMF. Hmm. It is when you sign the agreement to borrow that money and you agree to repay it, only then it became money. Yes, then it became money. So the banks now have unlimited money to lend, unlimited amount of money to lend. And I used the balloon in my last lecture to show that the balloon is expanding. The monetary supply, the money supply is constantly, constantly expanding. And the consolidation of political power in the world is constantly increasing. Constantly increasing to the extent that they could even try to attack Russia. 
with monetary and economic sanctions. And then I found, I, I explained to you in the last lecture, that all of this is meant to eventually cause the balloon to bust. Because the United States is not meant to rule forever. I use a verse of the Quran, you remember? In which surah was it? Do you remember? Suratul Mursalat, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Intaliku, proceed now. Let the historical process now proceed. Ila zillin, to a shadow. Zi salasi shu'ab. A shadow which will manifest itself in three stages. Our interpretation, our ta'wil, is that this shadow which will now emerge in the historical process in three stages is the shadow of Dajjal. In the first stage is Pax Britannica. The shadow comes in the second stage, Pax Americana. And then in the third stage and last stage of the shadow, the world will experience an attempt by the state of Israel to rule the world in what they would call Pax Judaica. When will the balloon bust? When the balloon busts, not only will the US dollar collapse, but Brexit means that the euro will also collapse. That's why you had Brexit. So the entire world of paper money will collapse. No, no single money in the world will be able to survive. The Malaysian ringgit cannot, cannot, cannot survive independently. No. <laughs> The Pakistani rupee cannot survive. The Egyptian pound cannot survive. The Indonesian rupee cannot survive. None, none, none can survive because they're all interdependent. So when the US dollar collapses, when the balloon bursts, one day it'll have to burst. It cannot expand indefinitely. The entire system will collapse. And they want it to collapse because they want to introduce another monetary system, which is what we want to talk about today in this lecture, beyond the petrodollar. What can we expect? Well, first of all, let us go back now to the Hadith, which is in Sahih Bukhari. It's a very important Hadith, a prophecy of Akhirul Zaman in which Nabi Muhammad والسلام, prophesied that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. You've heard it from me before. Others don't talk about it. I'm one of the few people who mention this hadith constantly again and again. If you're fed up listening to me, go listen to somebody else. But I have to repeat it. The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And people will fight for that gold. And 99 out of, every, out of every 100 of the combatants will be killed. And everyone will say, I will be the one who will survive. But the Muslims, the believers, must not touch that gold. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that 99 out of every 100 of the combatants, that is, who fight in this war would be killed. This cannot therefore be conventional warfare. This would be a unique warfare in human history. There's never been a war like this before in human history. For the first time in human history, a war will take place in which 99% of those who fight will be killed. I hope the U.S. armed forces listen to me. I hope the British armed forces listen to me and the French armed forces listen to me and the German armed forces listen to me and the Singaporean armed forces listen to me. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Listen to him, because your life now depends on it. He said that 99% of those who fight in this war 
will be killed. That's what the prophet said 1400 years ago. That war is around the corner. Not because Russia wants the war, no. That war once is around the corner because they, the Zionists, the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, which controls power in the United States and Britain and France and Germany, they want the war. They are lusting for that war. And the poor innocent people who have their brains brainwashed in all of these countries are being taken like cattle to the end. Because Russia says, Putin said it, President Putin said it, and we're proud of President Putin. He said, don't mess with nuclear Russia. There are those who don't like me because I praise Pre President Putin, because I praise Russia. I say to them, the door is there, you can leave. Get out and just leave me alone. I don't need you. This is harsh language for you. I'm fed up of you. I'm proud of President Putin. He said, don't mess with nuclear Russia. Russia is not prepared to bend her knee to the Zionists. I wish we had governments in the world of Islam like that. President Hugo Chavez in Venezuela was like that, and he paid the price. Charles de Gaulle in France was like that, and he paid the price. Whoever stands up against them, pay the price. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in Pakistan stood up to them, yes. And while Zulfikar Ali Bhutto has his weaknesses and defects, we admire him. We admire Zulfikar Ali Bhutto because he stood up to them in 1973 to 1976. Ziaul Haq in Pakistan had his defects, General Ziaul Haq, yes. But then he also had a change of heart and he stood up and resisted him and he paid the price. Yes. So for Russia to stand up, Russia knows there's danger. Imagine that Russia says to them, we're not afraid of you. We'll not bend our knees to you. And the Russian people know that nuclear war is coming. The Russian people know that millions and millions and millions will die. And yet President Putin's ratings remain very high amongst the Russian people. They're not afraid to die. No, the war is coming. It's going to be a nuclear war. It's going to be a war with the use of weapons of mass destruction. Yes, for the first time in human history. This is the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him. And if the Russian people are not afraid to die, why should you be afraid to die? If a Christian is not afraid to die, why should a Muslim be afraid to die? No, we are not afraid to die. It is when this big war takes place that perhaps the balloon will bust. We're not going to analyze the nuclear war at this time. We're only go referring to it in the context of our lecture on money. Beyond the petrodollar, therefore, is a new kind of money which will not be money-based on oil. What kind of money will it be? In Pax Britannica, it was the British pound. In Pax Americana, it was the US dollar. So what kind of money will there be in this so-called Pax Judaica? Answer, electronic money, digital money. And I learned a new term now, it's called virtual money. Very cute terms, eh, they coin. I used to think that fiat was just an Italian motor car until I heard it. There's something called fiat money. I don't know where they get these terms from. 
where they pick it up, like Arab Spring. Hmm? So it's now going to be virtual money. Money that is invisible. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. No. Electronic money. And we will no longer have a multiplicity of currencies in the world. No. The idea is to get all of mankind under one government, one world government, so that one people can rule the world, and they can then transfer that power to the state of Israel, so that Israel become the ruling state in the world in succession to the United States. This is our eschatological explanation of the historical process. And then at the end of the day, someone will stand up in Israel and declare, I am the Messiah. I have been explaining this for 14, 15 years, or 16 years now in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran. Those who have read the book, of course, they know all of this eschatology. But there are those who don't want to read or who are afraid to read. But I have a question. I can't understand how in a post-nuclear world, when thousands of nuclear weapons have exploded, when there have been days without any sunlight, when most of mankind have perished, and there's a rump of mankind still surviving, how will Israel, how will the banking system survive? And how will you be able to use electronic money? And then someone came from Saudi Arabia and met with me and explained to me, he says, what will, what will perish would be wireless communication, electronic money that is conveyed through the wireless system. But when it is conveyed through cables, underground cables, that will still survive. So the internet will not collapse, no. Only that part of the internet will survive, which is protected, which is conveyed through cables and fiber optics and so on. And I understood now, now I understand, how is it possible in a post-nuclear world for an electronic monetary system to uh, replace uh, the petrol dollar? That will be, of course, a financial Guantanamo, a monetary Guantanamo, because you can't take your money out of the banking system. No. All you can do is transfer from one account to another. So your money is hostage in their banking system. And the minute you step out of line, and they, they, they perceive you as a threat to them, they can freeze your account. That's all. And you have no money. At that time, don't blame me. So our response should be, at this time, is to, first of all, recognize that all of this is not happening by accident. That there is an explanation of this movement away from real money to bogus money. And then, finally, that uh, at the end of the day, after the um, electronic monetary system has given them that consolidation of power that they need, <coughs> that Israel will then proclaim itself to be Holy Israel, or what I call the Khilafah state, the Khilafah state. Um, Every Muslim knows what is a Khilafah state. Israel, the Jews want to establish a Khilafah state. That's what they want to do. Because what Nabi Dawood Islam, the Prophet David did, was to establish a Khilafah state. That's what Nabi Suleiman Islam did, the Prophet Solomon. A Khilafah state. And they want to establish a Khilafah state. And that Khilafah state, of course, cannot use bogus money. They'll have to use dinar and dirham. So at the end of the day, even the virtual money and electronic money and digital money will all go. 
and Dean Aaron Dilram will retain his money. I hope I am not alive for that day because the shame and the embarrassment will be too great for me. And we Muslims, we have the Quran, we have Nabi Muhammad Islam, and we surrender dinar and dirham, and they are our enemies, they brought back dinar and dirham. I don't want to be living to see that day. When, um, <coughs> when Israel uh, assumes Pax Judaica, and the electronic monetary system replaces the um, the petrodollar monetary system. Uh, I envisage that the rope around our necks will become tighter and tighter. And that the, the, the descent into slavery will be accelerated. Indonesia is so miserably poor. Millions of Indonesian women who are our daughters have to work as slaves in Singapore and elsewhere with the salary of a slave. I have spoken on this again and again. If you're a Singaporean, don't be angry with me. Because in your grave, you'll have to answer. You'll have to answer. If you have an, an employee and you pay that employee the salary of a slave, you will have to answer for it in the grave. Yes. If no Singaporean woman will work for that wage, that the Indonesian slave works for. That's oppression. And Allah does not have any tolerance for oppression. So the oppressor will pay for it in the grave. Is there slavery in Akhir Zaman? Is that what the world is coming to? When uh, electronic money replaces the petrodollar? Yes. When the angel Gabriel, Jibra'il Islam, came and met with the Prophet Islam, you remember in the masjid? He came in the form of a human being and he asked five questions. The Prophet Islam answered the five questions, then he left. And then the Prophet turned and asked his companion, do you know who he was? They said, Allah and the messenger know best, we don't know. And then he said, that was Jibra'il Islam, the angel. Gabriel, who came to teach you your religion. The last of the five questions was about the signs of the last day. And the Prophet Islam gave two signs. One of them was slavery. He said that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. We do not have the time today to expand and explain what we've done in previous lectures an interpretation of this prophecy that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. But this hadith um, indicates to us that there is slavery at the end of history. And I anticipate that the electronic monetary system will take us to that slavery. The electronic monetary system is targeting all of mankind, as the petrodollar system did. But now I want to explain to you that amongst all of mankind is one special group who are specially targeted. Who are they? Answer, the Arabs. This is because they are the greatest immediate threat to Israel, the Arabs. And... Uh, the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, prophesied the destruction of the Arabs. He was asleep. This is a hadith of Sahih Bukhari. He was asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he saw something in his dream. It was a vision. It was terrible. And he woke up with his face flushed red. And he woke up with the words, Wailul Arab min Sharrin Khalik Taraba. Woe unto the Arabs because of a great evil which is now approaching. What evil did he see? He then raised his hands like this 
And he said, today a hole has been made. Today. Have you heard the word? Today. 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 Today a hole has been made in the Radam. Radam? Radam is the barrier built in the form of a dam. Built by Zulkarnain to contain Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog, of course, are in the Quran. And if you do not know who are Gog and Magog, you are neglecting the Quran. What Zulkarnain did uh, in the language of a game called chess is to checkmate Gog and Magog, who are vicious people who perpetrate facade, corrupting and destroying everything. So by building this barrier in the form of a dam, they are contained, they cannot come out. So long as they are there behind that barrier, that dam, the world is safe. When will they come out? The Quran says, For either Ja Wadu Rabbi Ja'alahu Dakka'a. Allah will bring down that barrier one day. And Gog and Magog are going to be released into the world. When will Allah bring it down? When will Allah bring down the barrier and release Gog and Magog? Who will answer that question? Is it the Hadith or is it the Quran? Who have priority? Who has absolute authority? Where is absolute truth located? Is it in the Hadith or is it in the Quran? <laughs> Answer. You must always go to the Quran first, not to the Hadith. And it's only when the Hadith is in harmony with the Quran that you accept the Hadith. But if a Hadith is in conflict with the Quran, you put it aside. If a hadith is neither in harmony nor in conflict with the Quran, you will accept it, but you give it a lower status. Yes. So when will Allah bring down the barrier? The, the answer, of course, is in the Quran. But Allah will bring them down. And after they are brought down into the, from the from release from that barrier, they will spread out in all directions and take control of the world with their power. And when that happens, then you will see that the people who belong to a town, the town was destroyed by Allah. This is the Quran. And they were expelled from the town. That you see those people being brought back to that town. Gog and Magog will bring them back. This is the Quran in Surah al Anbiya. We're not going to Hadith, we're going to Quran. And which town is it? The town is Jerusalem. If it's not, then tell me who it is. So the Prophet ﷺ now has a vision. And in that vision, he sees that Gog and Magog are released. All that, the release has commenced. It will take a long time before they spread out and take control of the world. It will take a long time before the Jews are brought back to the Holy Land, brought back to take control of Jerusalem brought back to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land, brought back so that Israel could now try to become the ruling state in the world. It'll take a long, long time. But when were they released? When? He says, it was in his lifetime that the release took place, that the barrier was brought down. In his lifetime. Today, he said, today, he said, Allah has made a hole in the barrier. Gog and Magog will now be released. And this is bad news for the Arabs in particular. So the monetary system is only part of the overall attack on the Arabs. But this part of the attack on the Arabs is meant to enslave them. So when he said, Arab Woe unto the Arabs because of a great evil which is now approaching them. She asked, this is Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala, Will we be destroyed, we Arabs, would we be destroyed 
even though there are righteous people amongst us, even though there are righteous people amongst us? He said, Naam. Naam. The Arabs are going to be destroyed. Even though there are righteous people amongst them. When will they be destroyed? He said, Iza kathur al khabas. When rubbish prevails, then the Arabs will be destroyed. We are now in the age of the rubbish. The most dangerous part of the rubbish or the garbage is the monetary system. That monetary system is enslaving the Arabs, putting some Arabs onto the gravy train, the petroleum one, and the rest of the Arabs increasingly, increasingly, increasingly being destroyed. And so, we now ask ourselves, if we are to respond to this immensely dangerous challenge in the world of money, what do we do? This lecture points out that one possible response is to make our money redeemable in gold. When uh, Indonesia became independent, President Ahmad Sukarno called in the ulama and asked them about the status of paper money. And they explained to him that the paper money would be halal provided that it is redeemable in gold. That's what they said to him. I don't know whether the ulama in Indonesia remember that today. But that's what the ulama told Sukarno, that if the paper money is redeemable in gold, it's halal. And Sukarno actually fixed that so much paper money will be equal to so much in gold, and you can take your paper money and you can get the gold. That's why they had to kill him. He had to be removed. If you attempt to do that now, to have your paper money redeemable in gold, first of all, you have to have enough gold. And they have done everything they could possibly do to control all the gold reserves of the world. But Allah can always bring more gold into the world. Yes. One of the prophecies of Akhir Zaman is that the earth will vomit from its liver columns of gold and silver. So new gold coming into the world. So they can't control all the, world of, all the gold in the world. If one country in the world is able to make its currency redeemable in gold, their whole system collapses. Everything will collapse. At this time, perhaps the only, the only people who could do that, who have the power to do it, would be Russia and China. May Allah take these words of mine to the Russian government, to the Chinese government, that you take your BRICS, your alternative monetary system, and seek to see, find a way in which you could make your money redeemable in gold. The second response that we have to share with you is that which we have said again and again and again and again, that in the Sunnah, you can monetize commodities of food consumption, like rice and use rice as money. Mm. And in this way, you will extricate yourself from that, that um, electronic monetary system which is meant to enslave you. Um, but now we turn to a third response. And that is that nothing can be done in the world of Islam. Nothing can succeed in the world of Islam unless and until we get the scholars of Islam to support it. So the time has come for me to ask you. I'm an old man now, I'm 74 years of age, I'll soon be 75. I don't know how much time there is left before Allah calls me away. But wherever you are in the world, and these words of mine were to reach you, and you are Muslim, even if you're not a Muslim, go to the scholars of Islam, wherever they are, and you can meet them. 
and ask them, this money that we are now using, we don't see this money in the Quran, we don't see it in the Sunnah. It's new, it's never been used before. Is this money halal or is it haram? Ask him. If Imran Hussein is wrong, please tell us what is right. Go to every scholar of Islam you can meet and put this question to them and tell them, when you give me your answer, I want you to, to know that I want to use your answer publicly. I'm not speaking to you privately. I don't want any answer given to me in privacy. No, we want an answer that can be publicly revealed to the public. So this is a, this is a, a call I'm making today to you. I'm just one solitary voice, but Allah can take this voice many places. Go to the scholars of Islam and demand from them a response. Before I end, let me say that having studied Islamic eschatology, I have come to the conclusion that it is only a Khilafah state that has the power ready to be able to defy this bogus monetary system and restore dinar and dirham as money today. Only a Khilafah state. And what is a Khilafah state? I have a lecture coming soon, inshallah, entitled Iqbal, Pakistan, and the Khilafah state, in which I hope to be able to explain what is a Khilafah state. But to be brief, a Khilafah state is a state in which God's law is supreme. And that's what Israel wants to do. That's what the Jews want to do. They want to establish a state in the Holy Land in which the law of the Torah is the highest law. What Nabi Muhammad established in Medina was also a Khilafah state. The law in that state, Allah's law in the Quran is the highest law. Allah's law in the Torah, Allah's law in the Quran is the same law. Except that sometimes there's something called naskh or cancellation and abrogation. And for that, I'd like you, can I give me a copy, please, of um, methodology? I would like you to take a look at my book on methodology for the study of the Quran so that you'll be able to uh, use that book to ex understand the subject of um, cancellation and abrogation, where one law in the Torah is cancelled and replaced by another law uh, in the Quran. Methodology for the study of the Quran. Um, a Khilafah state is not only a state in which Allah's law is the supreme law, but also it has to be a state of caste where there is no authority and no law higher than Allah's law. So a Khilafah state cannot be a member state of the United Nations. A Khilafah state cannot be a member state of the International Monetary Fund. No. A Khilafah state has to be a state in which the supreme authority is Allah's. And that's what they want to do with the state of Israel. That's what they want to do. We hope and we pray that uh, the lecture which is to come on uh, Iqbal, Pakistan and the Khilafah state would uh, explain the subject and inshallah that a movement can be launched to try to restore the Khilafah state uh, in which we'll be able to effectively, effectively deal with the bogus monetary system. So long as Gog and Magog took control of the world, it's not possible to restore the Khilafah state and therefore to break the back of this bogus monetary system. You can't do it. However, the war which is coming, the nuclear war, is going to break the back of Gog and Magog. Yes, how do I know that? Because the next event to take place after the war, the great nuclear war, is the conquest of Constantinople. 
And if Constantinople is to be conquered, the implication is Gog and Magog no longer have the power to resist. No. As a consequence, I've come to the conclusion that it is possible for us, as never before in the last few hundred years, it is possible for the last 100 years, it is possible for us to now restore the Khilafah state. An effort can be made to restore the Khilafah state in the wake of the nuclear war which is coming. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may take these words of mine to those of you around the world who agree with me that this is a bogus monetary system and we ought to respond to it authentically. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.